Aha. Well, it is uh, 1030. 1029. Wow. I'm actually a little bit earlier than projected. Sorry about the delay. Um, I, you know, sometimes there's just other things that have to happen. And this happened to be one this morning. I needed to make a, have a phone call. Um, yeah, and it uh, took about as long as I thought it would. Anyway, um, I guess there we go. I don't know if you can see the cursor or not. I can see it. Maybe you can't. Let's see, the music is playing. The cameras are on. Uh, the microphone is working. It says it's recording. Wow, things are working this morning, at least as far as I can tell. So, welcome to Relaxing Painting. Hi, who? Yes, I will do a flip sooner than later. I will get to it quickly. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm <laughs> trying to refocus after going after the phone call, which was an okay call, but anyway, I have to refocus. So, um, yeah, things are working. So, some exciting things today. Um, after after the uh, relaxing painting on Friday, I just, you know, these things come like in a package of like a dozen. Um, this one just got so messed up with so many colors, so many colors on this little Pesocoado kind of thing that um, I really couldn't get it clean anymore. So you're going to witness the retirement of a little plastic palette and the appearance of a brand new clean one. This is pretty exciting stuff. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because, you know, let me see if I can, you know, I'm just gonna go put it in the trash if I throw it across. There. Let's see how long this one lasts. Um, I'm going to take a chance here and flip sear or not sear. Okay. One, one, two to one, three to one, four to one. That was off screen. Five to one. Five to two, that's seven, huh? Yeah, that's not it. That this isn't random. Well, well, I mean it is random, but it wasn't fifty-fifty. Uh, what will be done on relaxing painting today? There will be several things. One thing will be the completion of this guy by painting the head. So it's from the neck up here. I need to get the four different colors on these little fins, do some blue on the face, highlight it in white. Anyway, I'm going to do I'm going to do my best to make it look kind of like that. Okay? So that's going to take a while. And then I have some new things to paint. Let, let me show them to you cuz I get to pick one of these to work on cuz I'm probably going to finish this the head of this, I don't know, if I paint at my usual pace, it might take until two o'clock. But I've got I've got more things that came off of the rosin printer over the weekend and they are already primed and ready to go. There is a peasant. I'm told that this is just a peasant carrying a pitchfork with a really oh, awkwardly located printing. There's a little pitch, see, right there. That has to come off without breaking the pitchfork. And a torch. And uh, yelling. It's an angry peasant with a thing that needs to be fixed on its pitchfork. And then there is like, um, I don't know, like a dragonkin or something maybe. Just a vicious looking warrior with all sorts of extravagant uh, little wings on their shoulder armor and faces on the knees of their boots, kind of. 
I don't know what this is all about. I don't know. Got a big hammer and a shield. It could be kind of fun to paint. Um, it's almost like a jester hat. I don't know if those are supposed to be horns on its head or part of its... I think they are. I think that I think this is like a demon kind of thing with horns. So I'm not sure how to paint this one. I'll have to get some advice about colors. It could be kind of fun to paint. And then um, I, we got a little like gnome or halfling. I think it's like a halfling miner carrying a backpack full of pebbles and holding um, holding a rock in their hand and a pick. This would be this would be kind of fun to paint too. You know, it's not real complicated. Um, and the, this could be like a sack of gold or silver, you know, or maybe like a combination of gold and silver, and that could be a giant nugget. Or they could just be rocks. That could be kind of like little blue rocks or gray rocks or something. But I think I think this will be a, a about to be very wealthy small thing. Hi, Gregor's man. Thanks for joining in. Um, I really appreciate it. Hopefully you'll enjoy whatever I end up doing today. I'll get around to doing something. Sorry it started late, but I guess that worked out okay. So, yeah, this is something else I could paint when I'm done with the Quetzalcoatl, which will be sometime this morning. And then there's this. I'm told that this is a goose. Okay. Um, a goose bard. So if you've been watching our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, or even if you aren't, haven't been watching, you could. You could go back and watch it. We have a bard in our group. Our bard was a tabaxi, which is a cat-like animal. And because of an interaction with an adversary, was transformed into a badger. Um, the badger is playing a saxophone, which is kind of interesting. Um, I actually painted that figure on this stream. I painted a saxophone playing badger with a pink Panama with a purple hat band, the hat. Okay, so that's how I painted it. Anyway, um, yeah, I painted it and it turned out that our tabaxi bard was turned into a badger bard. So now I've got a goose playing a lute or, yeah, it looks like it's supposed to be a lute. Um, I'm wondering, I'm just wondering out loud if I paint this, whether our badger would be transformed once again into a gigantic goose. I mean, this, this figure is really gigantic. This is standard height. Okay. So this is not like a goose sized goose. This is a gigantic goose. So, um, yeah. I mean, and this is supposed to be painted like a goose, so I actually went out of my way to um, print out, just like I did with the Quetzalcoatl, I printed out goose colors, so I, I have to make it look authentically goosey. You know, the most important part is that little white thing right along its, the top of its chin. That's the most important part. Uh, the rest of this is, you know, whites and browns and things, which would be a pain to, real pain to paint. It just will be, but there aren't too many colors involved. So at some point in the future, um, this will get painted Canada goose colors, and we will all hope, really hope that uh, our tabaxi bard, who is now a badger bard, you know, thank you. Yeah, they are. They come out of the rosin printer really, really well. Um, the fidelity is terrific, you know. And then they get painted, you know, on the stream here, like like this one got painted a while ago. A little arrow shooting sprite kind of thing, except it's not little. It's like as tall as my character, which is a Frabog fighter. Um, so what will I paint after I'm done with the Quetzal? I'm going to paint either the peasant because it looks like something easy to do or the, the little miner 
I'm not ready to paint the goose yet. And this one, I'm not, I don't know what to do with it. I'm not sure whether this should be painted like gaudy or whether this should be painted like really serious. It's, God, it's really weird. This is very weird. It's got these huge like epaulets with wings and stuff on its shoulders um, and a breastplate and then uh, a loincloth, basically. So its midsection is unarmored. Very weird model. I might paint that uh, third if I can figure out, if I can get some advice about what that's supposed to be. So one of these two will follow this, and all I have left is the head. So, you know, um, yeah, I spent 15 minutes not painting, which is kind of typical. Setting these up out of the way here. It's kind of standard for me. Then, um, yeah, I need to find the colors. Colors I've been using is this one. That's the undercoat. And then I'm going to need, not the really dark one, but just the orange. The, the, media, the intermediate color goes on these. I'm going to need a blue. I want the lighter of the blues here. And then I will need some sort of, it looks like it's very white. Uh, not ivory, but very white um, highlighting. So I've got ivory, which is a little bit yellower, which would look a little more natural. But if I really want very white, white, you got it that white. Um, yeah, those might be all the colors I need to finish this. The, um, and then I have to paint the base, which will be a little bit, you know, I have to get a brush in there around the bottom and stuff. So I'm going to stick this on one of these sticky tag holders. This is usually kind of holds pretty well. When I was painting this on Friday, it fell off all the way to the floor, which is concrete. And I was shocked. I mean, absolutely shocked that I did not break something because it hit the floor pretty hard. Let me move these out of the way. Actually, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one and turn it over so that there's like a white surface that will show things better. So if I eventually start doing anything, I always do my best to avoid doing anything really on relaxing painting, but it comes a time when I need to move on and actually do some painting and talk about what I'm doing and then maybe talk about, you know, 60s TV or something, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to take my glasses off so I can sort of see close up because of the fine detail, the little detail on the top here because it's very small. I am going to wear my head magnifiers and only use little teeny brushes. Yeah, the first thing I'm going to do is put a base coat on the little frills around its head. <laughs> yeah, I've got a vor little like a vortex spinner thing here off screen that you can't even hear but sometimes if I get it right I can make it rumble. This is like the geekiest thing in the world but it really makes a huge difference for me because I can actually see things. There is I was on there before. 
It's like a little drop of plastic off of one side of one of these frills that really, really should not be there, but it's on a spot that's so fragile that if I do anything to try to take it off, I mean, even if I try to, like, use a pair of surgical nippers or something, um, it will uh, break something else. So that is just going to have to stay there. And hopefully it won't show too terribly much when this is done. It's, it's on the bottom side. So I found on the wings that using the oranges and yellows and stuff that this sort of beige colored base coat really makes a big difference um, can only then I can get away with just using one coat of those colors otherwise I'd have to use two or three if I just left it on the gray primer there's another lump under here yeah fortunately it's on the bottom on the back and it doesn't it isn't going to really show Yeah, almost keeping it on. Okay, what I need is I, I need a mark there. X marks the spot. I know it it uh, messes up the whiteness of it, but it tells me where the camera is pointing. As you know, this is not a studio. This is... Uh, our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, our show has a studio with all sorts of wonderful lights and microphones and multiple cameras. And sound dampening stuff on the walls and the ceiling. So it's like a studio, like a real studio. Um, relaxing painting got some leftovers so everything here in the workshop every bit of it is just like a uh, little like bits of stuff that was tested and found wanting or got old or basically would have been discarded if it wasn't being used for this so Yep, got a little microphone off to the side here that's not good enough for the Dungeons and Dragons show. I've got this little ring camera here that um, I have no idea why we even bought it in the first place because it, it couldn't be used in the show at all. I move the camera this way thing this way too because I'm holding it in. it's like I'm going off screen the computer is I don't know like seven or eight years old or something and uh, it doesn't have to work very hard to control things the stream deck is One of the first ones we used, and then it proved inadequate. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Really appreciate it. Welcome. Okay. Um, the rest of this head is going to be painted blue, as is the the tips of these. The I want the paints to kind of blend a little bit. So if I'm looking at the model, the, um, the orange color, which I'm going to use next, goes on the inside of these frills, and then it's kind of blue around the edges. So because blue comes last, comes after this, I'm going to paint the inside of these head frills first. Okay. 
There isn't very much of them, and I'm going to paint too much because I'm going to be painting over them. When I'm looking over, I'm looking at this, which is a picture of what it's supposed to look like. So I'm painting this bit first. I'm trying to get these colors in here, these little orange inserts inside the frill. And I'm going to paint the head and the rest of this and the veins on the frill blue. And then I'll be getting out either ivory or white and doing all of this highlighting using kind of a dry brush technique that I'm not good at. And I painted the beige underneath because this color in particular does not go well at all well. The um, gray prime it just looks really messy. to do about the bottom. What I mean is the uh, the underside of these frills are really hard to get to. Could do sort of the same thing with the color. No, well, I'm gonna try. bottom is not well defined anyway. I think they're just going to be painted blue. Okay. Let that dry out for a bit. Um, yeah, before I put the blue on, Otherwise, it's. I want them to kind of flow together anyway, but not as much as it would if I didn't wait for just a couple of minutes. So, well, I'm waiting for just a couple of minutes for that to dry before I do the blue here. Um, what can I do? Well, I should. I can stir the paint. This is a, this is, there's two, three colors of blue on here, but two on the body. One is a, what it is, is it's a darker blue undercoat. And then I dry brushed this color that I'm stirring right now on the tops of the scales. And I think actually the effect, you can actually see it on screen. The effect came through pretty well. That the scale pattern is highlighted by the lighter blue color. So that, that worked okay. But the head is a lighter blue, it's not the dark blue. And there's two parts to doing the head with the blue. One is the head itself, which just is blue, with then, then it'll have white highlights on it. And the other is the frills. And I have to be a little cautious with the frills. The tips are blue, but I don't want to lose the orange on the, on the very bottom of it all. Didn't I didn't get I didn't turn it right in the very front. No, anyway. And then there's little stuff later like trying to paint the eyes and the nostrils and stuff. That's gonna be you know, all those tiny things sometimes are a challenge. With these bottles, sometimes I just need to shake it by hand 
in addition to the mixing with the little vortex spinner thing. Use two kinds of paints. Wait, here I'm using um, Emia colors now in these giant jars, and we purchase those for the most part for the dungeon tiles because we use when when painting dungeon tiles we use large quantities of paint. So, so these jars. These bigger jars were really efficient, economical, um, but they're not—they're not the greatest for mini painting. Because it just gets exposed to the air too much when it's open. And I'm usually using the equivalent of like a dot. You see, like here, I squeezed out just dots of paint from the Viejo bottles, and that was um, actually too much. So I'm using little dots of paint here. The Tamiyas are great for the dungeon tiles, though, because they have all sorts of browns and rays and things which are good for the stonework and the other aspects of the of the dungeon tiles which I, I will show off later is on every stream I try to get some time to show the dungeon tiles that we make for our Dungeons and Dragons show which is how relaxing painting got started to begin with which was the preparation of those tiles for the show so, well if you're going to take some time taking time to paint all the dungeon tiles you might as well stream it that's what our dm said And the painter said, why would I want to do that? He says, well, you're doing it anyway. What's the difference? I mean, you're, gonna, you're doing the painting anyway, so if we set up some cheap leftover equipment and stream it, you know, is that a problem for you? And I says, no, I don't care. Because I'm just going to be painting anyway. Then the DM says, well, you know, if you're going to be painting anyway, you try to keep up some sort of monologue to make it interesting because people might, might watch it. Like, you know, what can you do? Talk about 1960s, 50s, and 60s television. There isn't any, what else can one do during a relaxing painting stream? Those of you who have been watching this have learned about Tom Terrific. The destruction, the utter destruction of the uh, television antenna industry cable was was a job killing thing I mean totally wiped out the manufacturing and installation of television antennas just totally gone Ooh. suppliers all the material makers just everything you know I mean if some economists look looked at the devastation created by cable television it probably would have been even harder on 
I think they'd find that the impact was probably as big or bigger than the impact of uh, robots on the assembly line or automotive manufacturing. Here on this stream. The same thing is true of uh, vacuum tubes. Radios and televisions, transistors, transistors were job killing and totally annihilated in the industry. All of their suppliers and manufacturers and distributors and sellers and retailers and everything, uh, the vacuum tube industry, because all of the radios and televisions ran on vacuum tubes, vacuum tubes had a limited lifetime okay so there was always a demand for replacements it was not like you'd buy it once and that would be the end of it if you had something that worked on vacuum tubes you knew that sooner than later Tube would burn out, and it literally did. It just, the emitter just burned out. Tube. Okay, that isn't working really well. Even with a teeny brush. good as I can get, which is uh, not that great. I might have to try to put a little more orange back on there. It's supposed to be up on the frill. It's not bad, but what I might have to depend on more than anything is like the white highlighting to make it look good. I know. So nowadays, you know, we talk about changes in technology, you know, and we worry about that. We worry about and fret about it and talk about it and make a big deal about it. The, the consequences of, you know, job killing this or job killing that without really ever attending to the historical job killing devastation of things we don't think about, like transistors or cable TV. You know, they just came. Vacuum tubes disappeared. TV antennas disappeared. We don't think about the economic consequences of those, of those, those technological changes, which were immense. I mean, probably, like, maybe hundreds of thousands of people were affected by that. It wasn't any, you know, at the time, no great political uproar about that. No, like, no, no, don't do cable TV because that will be job killing. No, no, don't do transistors. That'll be job killing. I don't know why we didn't do that. Because they were. Those advances, you know, like the old proverbial buggy whip. You know, if you made those, your livelihood disappeared, and we just sort of joked about it. But those kinds of changes were really pretty devastating. Another one, we don't, which was extremely job killing that we don't really talk about is um, personal computers, okay? My brother and I were talking about this, and um, he 
There's thousands of people, mainly women. I mean, this was, this was a huge blow to f employment for women. I don't think about it this that way, but um, what did a lot of women do for a living, the ones who worked? They worked in a steno pool. What in the heck is that, right? What is that? Well, people who wrote correspondence didn't type it themselves. And the way correspondence worked is that it had to be typed, okay, and sometimes multiple copies. And bosses, because they were always bosses, didn't exactly handwrite their stuff. They dictated it. And so there was this entire, entire job classification, an entire huge thing of, of mainly women who took dictation either like with shorthand right there in person or through a dictaphone where someone recorded what they were doing and it would go down to the to the typists either in a pool or individually depending on you know the size of the office how much there was it would all get typed up and then frequently it would go back for revision after it was typed you know, they catch errors in the typing, but also the dictation didn't always come across the way people wanted it to. Um, so when PCs and email and stuff came out, people just typed their own stuff, you know? Now it's like texts and everything else. You don't have hundreds and hundreds of people pounding away on keyboards. Typewriters, not keyboards, they were typewriters. It all disappeared. Poof. Hundreds of thousands of jobs, mainly women, disappeared just like that and yet there wasn't any huge uproar there wasn't like a hue and a cry and a screaming about how we can't let that happen because it's job killing even though it was so it's just like who decides who decides to make a to-do about whether something is going to be job killing or not because you know you hear about that all the time. But the fact is that we have had huge waves of massive job killing in the past. TV antennas, vacuum tubes, steno pools, typists, okay? Shorthand, people who take shorthand and dictation, the people who made dictaphones, right? Whole industry gone. Poof, just like that. So I'm, I guess what I'm blabbing on about is that um, there's lots of job killing going on all the time. And for the most part, we don't notice it. It doesn't become an issue about which we notice or care. I think that's kind of hard. Okay, well, it's not great, but it'll do. That needs to dry now, and then I will take probably ivory, try to do some dry brushing and highlight, highlight the scale pattern on the frills and the head, and it will look much brighter than it does now. Anyway, I just, you know, wanted to talk about that because 
We talked about TV antennas before and vacuum tubes. But as my brother and I were chatting a while ago, um, you know, came to the recognition that that the whole typing thing. consequences of that. It's also a major wave of job demolition. Okay, that has that does need to dry before I can dry brush and that's it's taking a while. So I'm gonna set this aside and turn these off and take a look at what I've got coming up. I think I'm gonna work on the peasant guy. I'm going to work on the peasant guy because the peasant guy is should be really fairly easy to do. Okay, it's going to be just browns, you know, and black and brown, and then a lot of wash to make him look like he's been out in the field and working on that. And the pitchfork and the torch aren't all that big a deal, but what is a big deal are these mold these printing flaws a little if you can see them see it coming off the top there little bits of plastic that when they're painted are just going to look terrible so i'm going to get a file be back in just a second these little needle files which are fine-toothed um, kinds of things and I'm going to attempt to file those bits off without breaking without breaking the pitchfork which is very fragile It take a while just I can't put much pressure on it and I can't do much lateral work on it because it would uh, snap the handle off I just know that because I've done this before and have succeeded in breaking things pretty often often Well, since we're talking about controversial things today, like, you know, how entire classes of jobs like buggy whips, all the jobs associated with TV antennas, all the jobs associated with vacuum tubes, all the jobs associated with, you know, the typing pools and things can just disappear over a fairly quick period of time. And sometimes, unless, unless you are a person who's actually directly caught in it, uh, we're not even aware of it happening. I can talk about the another controversial thing. I can talk about this and blame my brother because he's the one who really, he's really upset about this. It's the pronunciation of often. O-F-T-E-N, where people say often. Yeah. That's a fairly recent development. We never said often, we said often. And he likes to go on and on and say, do you say listen? Do you listen or do you listen? Because it's the same thing at ST, right? So do you listen to things? And there's other words like that, where it's an ST word. And we don't say the T, but we do when we say often. But when did that start and how? Is it correct? It's just, just a weird thing that is limited to one, one T word off, often, as opposed to often, or does it apply to other silent T words like listen? Love is getting smaller. 
You can see now it is smaller than it was before. Another one, whistle, whistle. Do you whistle or do you whistle? Or is the T silent only after an S? Mm -hmm. uh, silent after an F. Let's have a silent T, a silent T controversy. I think. Good thing I, I never get on social media, so there probably is. There's probably like an entire thread on every social media forum about about that, and it, probably people are getting, you know, all like serious about it too. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not on social media, so I don't know that. I don't know if that's true or not, that there is such a thing. It's another one here at the bottom of the fork on the pitchfork. So this is basically, I'm fixing something that needs to be fixed, okay, where there's little flaws just as there are on the on the quetzalcoatl, actually. Um, but I'm taking some time to file them off here while I'm waiting for the paint to dry before I do the um, white highlighting that needs to be done on the head. be a little bit more assertive here because I can grip the fork of the pitchfork. No, we can't have a you know, a rampaging peasant is such a classic peasant, right? A pitchfork and a torch. This is a cliche peasant. And I will paint in cliche colors. Okay, well, it's not perfect, but it's mostly off. And I don't want to keep messing with it. Because then every time I touch it, it's an opportunity for breakage. Ah. Uh. Yeah, dry brushing this. What I want is some stiff, little stiff bristles. Kind of flat, you know, flat, stiff bristles. Actually, this brush is just about right if I can, if I am really careful and just barely touch the surface, even though it's fairly big, sort of gigantic compared to the thing. What I'm really trying to do is go across and just catch the tops of these things. So if I'm very, 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 very careful, I can avoid having to repaint the whole thing and start over. I don't know. Let's see if I can do that or not. If I can, then um, this will be pretty close to being done, other than the base that needs to be painted, and I can move on to something else. If not, then I need to let it dry and then uh, start over. This is why I didn't do the head of this on Friday. It was, you know, the end of the stream, and that's when focusing and eye-hand coordination and all of that sort of thing starts to fade a little bit. Actually, quite a lot. The end of the stream is a good time to not do anything that requires a deft touch. The way this is supposed to work now and it may or may not, 
is that all the raised surfaces, the tops of the scales and the tops of these little feathery things are supposed to be brightened. And just that, just those bits are supposed to be brightened. So I want there to be next to no paint on here. Just touch, barely touch the tops of these things. See that? I mean, you can, it's kind of working. Just the edges. The top edges of these scales getting lighter. Something similar is supposed to happen to these frills. This is a really cool technique if one can pull it off. In terms of getting highlights on things. Right there because I'm having to pay attention to what I'm doing. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. I think it came out kind of okay. I mean, it accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish, which was to put white highlights on the raised surfaces and kind of tone down the color at the same time. Two, there's something with the eyes. Special Quaddle's eyes on the picture are white. One is supposed to, in theory, get little white dots of paint, tiniest little white dots of paint on the eyeballs. See if that's possible. It's okay. It'll be okay. And then um, for the nose and the mouth, rather than using paint, I'm going to try to use the fine, really fine point felt pen. It's very fine and really, really fine.
Okay, well, never ever see that in person or on screen. All right, um, that uh, that went better than I uh, expected it would, which is nice. Um, so I you know, got the head of the Quetzal uh, painted, and it doesn't, you know, if you compare it to the thing that I was trying to match, it, you know, the frills didn't come out quite, they didn't look good. You know, that just didn't work out as well as that. Those are really cool, you know, with the yellow and the orange and the, but it gives the impression at least, it gives the impression of what it was supposed to look like. And the, the head, you know, didn't come out quite as the same as the picture, but it's, you know, it's not too bad. So the Quetzal here is, I'd say done except for the base. Clean this brush off a little better. It's a really good brush for the dry brushing. I need to remember that because it's square on the tip and it's fairly stiff. Um, yeah, always put that in the way. Put the thing with the fragile bits like forks and torches and things where you can knock it over and bump into it. I'm going to just paint the base. I'm tempted to kind of paint it brown. Kind of a light brown color to uh, so that the blue shows off against it. Can't really see the blue against the gray that well. So let me look at let me look at my brown colors. I'm thinking, I don't really want to make it look like dirt. I just want it a light brown bleh. buff. Buff's not bad. You can't see what I'm looking at. This is my color chart that I made because. The paints, you can't tell by looking at the paint bottle or the paint bottle cap uh, how it's going to look after it dries. And many paints change color pretty dramatically from when they're first applied until they dry. So I made, you know, this highly sophisticated uh, color chart. Leather brown, no, the buff, buff is this color here. I think that might work okay. Dark sand isn't too bad, but I'm kind of, it's got a little more yellow in it than I want. I like that because it doesn't have much yellow. This deck tan is too gray, too green. The bone white, this bone white, I used this on um, the machinery in the submarine. The problem with the bone white is that it takes like three coats and I don't want to mess around with that um, I don't want to keep do three coats on the base so I'm going to try to find his buff color it's not it it might be like one of the very few colors that's not duck this is buff yeah This is gonna. This has been sitting around for a long time. Um, we need some major, major shaking and stirring. After, uh, might as well keep showing this, right? I can lay it down so you can actually see it. The wings came out pretty well, I think. metal ball and these 
bottles that I put in there to help stir them up and get get a peg. These are like 50 little BB sized balls. Put them in the paint. It's like the metal ball in a spray paint can, right? Which is supposed to break up the sediment of the pigment that has settled. I'm going to have a jar for the squeeze thing. Okay, um, I have to use a little brush because I have to get like in here and underneath and then rotate it and try to get it in under there and rotate it some more and get in under there. Uh, remember to rotate it. The rotation is really important. I've discovered it's one of the more important things in relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons is rotating the work frequently um, because it is really easy to miss a spot or be able to reach it from a certain direction. Okay, this is where I, I need to slow down a little bit. Um, the oops factor, you know, it doesn't look like very much here compared to painting like the frill or something, but the oops factor is actually quite high um, because of taking the brush to and from the work surface. And the most frequent oops. The most frequent oops is um, bashing a paint laden brush up against something that's already been painted. Either on the way to or on the way from where it's getting painted now. Why did I save the hardest bit for near the end? Really? I'm just kind of dabbing the paint on. I actually want the base to have a little variation. You know, so it's not just blah. And I don't want to wash this one. I don't want to mess around like putting a gray or a brown wash on it or something. I'm just, it's just going to be beige. It's just going to be this light brownish kind of color. And it doesn't have to be perfectly uniform and I don't want to worry about brush marks in the you know, the traditional sense of streakiness. So I'm going to intentionally introduce um, a variation in, in lumpiness of the color by dabbing, the dabbing the old dab technique. And as usual, Turns out that the most difficult part is at the end because I don't know why. I didn't intentionally start with the easiest. I thought this would actually be some of the harder part under here, but this turned out to be the more difficult because I'm just getting underneath where it rises up off the base. to just go you know, around the uh, the edges here and the, the bottom of oil. I 
and try not to get paint too much. To the tail itself. I almost need the head magnifiers for this. Not, not just to uh, see the work better, but because it adds, it has those little headlights on it, little lights, which really help. And they help illuminate the work. This were a display model, which it can't be, because you know, I'm not, I'm not a painter with enough skill to do like display model level work. This is more of a studio model. Okay, it just has to look good enough at a distance on camera um, to look to look good enough. Let me just say that again. Um, but if someone were building a display model, well, they'd make a bigger one, first of all, probably. But in addition to having done a whole lot better job with the wings and the head and the detail on the model, that would probably take the time to do something with the base to make it look cool. Like put little sand on it or pebbles or, you know, some sort of texture. That's not this. That's not what this is. This is uh, the base. You know, if this shows up in our D and D campaign in our show, it's going to be something probably that we're fighting against, and the base just needs to be there to hold it up and um, you know to contrast with the show contrast with the model itself. So that the the model shows up. The idea here is just to have some sort of lighter colored base so that you can see the tail of the Quetzal. That's why I didn't do like gray. I wanted a more contrasty color. Okay, um, I'm just going to rotate it and make sure I didn't miss any big spots. If I miss little spots, if I can't see them, you know, with my unaided eye, then they're probably not going to show up if on, on screen if this is ever used. So, there. There is a little bit of an issue back here. I think I adjust that. It's just it, where it's where it rises up off the surface. There was a spot there that just needed a little more brown. Um, ta-da! I will do a ta-da at this at this point and say that this thing is done. I'm gonna lay it down like this so you can actually kind of see it, which you can't if it's vertical. There's a dog romping around upstairs. I hope they're just playing. Not out of control. Yeah, you can't hear it because this microphone does an excellent job of filtering out everything except the voice. So you can't hear the buzzing of the paint stirring thing and you can't hear the dog rumbling across and barking upstairs. 
it's not just tormenting a cat, but that it's actually playing. Um, there we go. I'm going to move the camera down a little bit. Okay. So that is the... The head came out okay. I mean, not great. Not not how I was totally how I was hoping it would look, but not bad. And I, I can't, you know, with the brushes and the skill level I have, maybe I could like do multiple dry brushing or something on these frills, but I just, just not, just can't pull it off. So um, this is what it's going to look like. If you see it during a D and D campaign, D and D show combat, maybe it's friendly. This, this actually might be a friendly creature, you know? It might be a helpful thing. Um, this is what it'll look like. I think it came out okay. I think the wings, wings are all, anyway, yeah. It's adequate. It's definitely adequate. Not much more than that, but definitely that. So the next step is to, um, take it off the sticky tack right <laughs> so I want to do that without snapping it in half so this this thing fell off the sticky tack twice but when I try to pull it off of course it's not coming so there it is Just show it off show it off a little bit before I set it aside and bring out the next one Um, yeah, I'm going to trade it out for a torch and pitchfork carrying peasant. What could be more cliche than a peasant screaming, holding a pitchfork and a torch? I can't think of anything much more cliche than that. So we're looking at basically um, like worn linen and uh, burlap kind of uh, coat here is I have a belt let me see I, I'm gonna pull these out sometimes hard to tell when I'm looking at it with just the, uh, the primer on it if there's detail there or not it has a very very poorly defined piece of cloth wrapped around its belly and sort of knotted up that's like a belt so that'll be a contrasting color so we've got this uh the shirt that goes down to the elbows who's that pants and boots so i'm looking at like three different colors maybe the boots will be really dark brown the pants will be lighter and then the top will be a little bit darker and then the belt I don't know maybe the boot color belts and boots right the guy is bald that makes painting the head a little easier there is a f piece of plastic right here at the back of the head that should not be there I will make an effort to get it off you have to be filed off basically the the ear does people's ears do not droop to their collars like that and I'll lose a little detail on the ear that nobody will notice but not have the earlobe extend all the way down to its shoulder
there, there was a silly song that my sister used to sing. Do your ears hang low? Do they wobble to and fro? You throw them over your shoulder like a continental soldier. That's what this guy is doing. The major ear thing there. Now it's off. Yeah, so this this uh, coat has like a cowl around the back, but what I'm looking at here is pretty much just brown with a brown wash on it to make it look kind of, you know, like I've been working out in the fields, peasanty kind of thing. You know, and then the arms and the face will get painted and they'll do something with the mouth. Maybe I'll put some black in there before I start uh, painting the rest. You know, the dark of the mouth, maybe I'll use the black red. So this won't be too challenging, which is good. I don't feel like being challenged today. It's like getting a, a peasant done. So yeah, I'm going to start my break at the usual time, even though I started late. So I need to pick some colors out for colors for this. So when we paint the inside of the mouth, this really dark red that we've got that um, that I've used fairly often. That'll be good. I will follow. You want another flip? I will. I will do a flip before break. Thanks for popping in. So I'll do the inside of the mouth with this, and I'll do that before it breaks so that it dries. And then, um, let's see, the clothes. Yeah, I just, we've just got these nice browns. They're just browns, right? And then I'll wash over them so that the peasant will look kind of brown. Right, there we go. The leather brown does look pretty leathery once it's washed. I'm going to use that on the pants. And then I'm going to use flat brown on the boots and flat earth on the tunic. The flat earth should be pretty good. I think that that's light enough that, I mean, it's dark enough to look like a dark peasant kind of thing, but it's light enough that the, the wash will show on it. So let me find those colors. They're probably colors I haven't had out for a while. I love the name of that paint though, flat earth. This is the red brown. This this red brown isn't any good anymore. Really pretty crappy, so I'm gonna use it. I'm just gonna use it for the boots and the belt. And I know the leather brown is one of the washes I'm gonna use later. I always love poking around on these paints because they all pile up here. They all get piled up. Beastie Brown. What does Beastie Brown look like? No, that's not right. Cork Brown. I'm going to use cork. I changed my mind about the, the tunic. I'm going to use this cork brown color. It's a little lighter. Um, and I should be able to find that because I've used it a lot. It's cork brown. It's red brown. And what's the other one I wanted? Here we go. This is this is your peasant ensemble. Pretty 
pretty brown and bleh. Just like it should be. Um, the torch, I need a I need a really dark brown, like flat brown probably for the pitchfork handle and the torch handle. That's the good bottle of red brown. Mm -hmm. Here's flat brown. I also have that in Tamiya. That's out somewhere. No, if I not, if not, I'll use it. I'll use this. And then uh, I can use steel for the pitchfork. Maybe I'll use a light, slightly lighter color, um, like dark aluminum, so I can make it look rusty. And then the flame is always fun. Like I'll end up with, like putting three different colors on this tiny little flame. I'll spend forever painting the flame. Um, and then the skin tone. Right. So, I have my assemblage of browny, beigey kind of colors. And it probably means I'm going to end up painting the base maybe green with a green wash on it to make it look like uh, a field, just so that it kind of contrasts with everything else. So, I'll be using this red brown as kind of a dark brown for the boots and the belt, and then cork brown for the tunic and leather brown for the pants and then I'll be using um, probably smoky ink and brown wash I've got this dark brown wash I'll be mushing that all over it to make it look streaky and worn and leathery and stuff like that um, before I go on break oh yeah you know, I have to do two things Three, among the things I need to do before the break um, is paint the inside of the mouth so that that's dry later because I'll be painting the face over it. Um, do a flip for a fala and tell you about what else I'm going to be doing after the break. Um, I already did a sear flip. I want to do a paint no paint flip. Paint. Paint over. Oh. Two to one, paint. Two to one, paint. Paint wins. So there. Okay. So let me um, paint the inside of the mouth first. This is a tiny, tiny little bit of paint on the end of a paintbrush going into the opening where the mouth is, just so that it shows later. Throwing it up on there, I'm just getting a little drop of it out of here. Barely enough, barely enough to do this. This is going to look really messy. Inside of the mouth. Yeah, we got the inside of the mouth and all over its face. But the face will be painted later. And the inside of the mouth will now have really dark red in it. Oh, you'll be able to see the shoutingness going on. Okay, so I did the flip. I painted the inside of the mouth. After break, I'm going to talk about Dyson Dungeons uh, Dungeons and Dragons show because I have to plug that. I'm going to show off dungeon titles. Ti titles. I'm going to try to talk in words, but I'm going to show off dungeon tiles. 
because that's a big part of how this all got started and they're really cool. Um, one of these days, you know, when I pull the dungeon tiles out, you'll see that they need some of them need to, to be washed. And actually, I might just I keep saying they're not washed and I don't wash them. I could just pull out the dark gray wash and wash them. I could do like two of the four and you could have a before and after look. I might do that. And then I also want to talk about Submarine Wednesday and the imminent ending of Submarine Wednesday because the submarine is going to be done. At least the parts that I can show on stream, the spray paint parts, the airbrush spray paint parts, I can't. That's painting the outside of the hull. I can't show that because I don't have a studio. I have a piece of cardboard and a ring camera. Okay. And I just, there isn't enough room here to put it. And I spray paint it. It'll go all over everything. And there's no camera on the spray booth. And so I'm going to do that off screen, but I'll show the prep work. Anyway, Wednesday, some re I'm going to do this after break. So why am I talking about it now? After break, I will be working on the peasant. I will be talking about the successor to the submarine. And I'll be talking about dungeon tiles. And there might be other things I'll do after break. But those three things, if I remember them, definitely will get done. So thanks for joining in so far. I will be away for about a half an hour. I keep saying I'm going to try to take a short break. I will say that anyway. I'm going to try to take a shorter break so I can get back and get this peasant guy going and talk about those other things that I was going to talk about. So I'll be back in roughly 30 minutes, give or take five. See you then. Okay, five minutes late. It's typical. Um, welcome back to Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons, where I will actually do some painting a little bit later. But first, I want to show off. I want to show off dungeon tiles in our Dungeons and Dragons show. We sometimes end up in dungeons. Okay, sometimes we end up fighting outdoors where we've got trees and tents and rocks and all sorts of scatter stuff that we've produced and painted on this stream. But if we're in a dungeon, we'll end up in a place like this, which is made out of stone, or this, which is made out of wood. And these all get printed on the PLA printer back there. Primed, base coated, um, highlighted, and then washed. This is unwashed stone, so it looks kind of flat, but I'll show you how this works. You know, the walls and the floor are a solid piece. There we go. We adjust that. Um, but underneath here are ball magnets in the corners, and this is the magic of our dungeon tiles in that they hold together and come apart very easily so that they can all be rearranged like this. It's really cool. So sometimes you can put clips in to hold them, but then they're hard to take apart. Or sometimes you put a magnet in the base, but then you need to have a metallic um, platform underneath for it to hold, because they don't hold to each other, they hold to the floor. But these hold on to each other, so they're really cool. Uh, these are the stones, these are wood. Okay, you can see that they're printed with a lot of wood grain. Um, these are actually painted in kind of a light brown color and then we have found this really neat wash that has some red in it to make it look like rich wood and then these stucco areas are painted in and they have the magnet on the base as well and some of the dungeons that we produce are they show up underneath the screen there like there's a, a workshop or a store or something there um, which is based on the the wood tiles and um, and we even have special tiles that have like sigils built into them. This is for sort of like a fire mage where there's a fire sigil and in the center there's actually a cauldron with a flame that comes out. So I wanted to show these because um, Dyson Dungeons is all about the Dungeons and Dragons show and relaxing painting was primarily about producing these uh, dungeon tiles for the show. 
One of these days, I'm gonna get out the gray wash and wash these so that at least a couple of them, so you can see what it looks like when they're washed, they look much more like stone. So that's one thing I wanted to do after the break. The other thing I want to do is start working on the, uh, start working on the guy here. Uh, I'm going to start from the top and work down, paint the tunic, paint the pants, paint the boots and the belt. And I, what I like to do when I'm painting edges, you know, between two different colors is paint up to from the bottom. Like if it's raised up like um, his tunic is higher than his pants. I like to paint up to the raised surface. Nicole, I know, likes to do it the opposite direction. She likes to paint down from the raised surface to the lower one. I don't think it matters which way. If you decide to paint things or if you're painting them, you have your own way of doing it. But the idea is to just get a nice clean line, which, you know, I used to be better at than I am now because, um, you know, old. I can't see, can't hold my hand still, all, all those, all sorts of excuses. So, um, yeah, I'm going to paint the tunic and then the pants and then the boots. And the tunic is going to be cork brown. And the pants are going to be leather brown. And the boots are going to be red brown. That's it. The flat brown is where the handles, uh, the pitchfork, and the, and the torch. Um, yeah, I probably don't need my head magnifiers on uh, to do this, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I do need to take these off, though, because the trifocals just are not good. They're just not... They don't work um, up close, really. They're okay for maybe reading, but for something like this, I want to look at it through the center and the trifocal part. I have to look down through the bottom of the lens, and painting like this isn't much fun at all. Okay. I'm going to try to, try to use a slightly larger brush because there's a, a lot of surface area on the tunic. And I don't care if I get the paint onto adjacent surfaces because I'll be painting up to them from the arms or the pants or the head later. So I just want to make sure that I get it covered. Right? To make sure of that. So give this a stir. After I get some of these base coat colors on, I'll be pausing a little bit and talking about Submarine Wednesday and what will happen when the submarine is done because it's really pretty close to being done. And if you join in on on Wednesday, if you join in on this coming Wednesday, you'll be seeing the last kind of bits being cemented together, hopefully without the disaster happening. Using any time... I use um, plastic model cement, which dissolves the plastic. There's the opportunity for disaster, like getting it on my finger and then touching a surface and putting a fingerprint imprint into the plastic, that kind of thing. There's always that kind of chance of, of uh, unintentional excitement. But anyway, I've got the nose and the tail and the um, part of the covering of the missile deck to be done. The missile deck part is actually going to be a little bit of a challenge and could end up taking a while because um, the hull of the submarine is warped. The submarine model is like 60 years old, right? <laughs> It's like 60 years old, and so you'd expect that not everything's in pristine shape. And in this case, it's not. You can see, so I'm going to be painting the inside of the cowl here. I know I'm getting paint all over what will be its neck, but I want to make sure that paint is 
down inside the top of the cowl, the tunic. And when I paint the head, when I'll be using the head magnifiers, you know, to make sure that I'm getting the line right. I will fix the mess that this is making. Because I know it's just, it is just making a mess. And then I just have this large expanse of tunic. Uh -oh. Okay, I didn't see that before. I'm going to fix that immediately. There's sometimes you just don't see things with the primer, but there's another one of these little pieces of extra plastic right at the bottom of the cowl there that should not be there. And it probably won't show up on the show, but clean that up a little later, but I want to paint this before it dries so I don't get all sorts of terrible brush marks everywhere. You know, and I get the bottom side of the tunic painted as well. And then the sleeves. And I'm intentionally painting it past the end of the sleeve onto the part where the arm is because it's just, it really is actually easier, at least for me, to see where the boundary line is between the tunic and the arm if it's painted over the primer. Sometimes I find those things hard to see when it's all primer color. Yeah, this is this is appropriately blah. He's actually got a belt buckle. See, I didn't see that when it was just a primer. It's a, a very poorly defined belt uh, around the tunic here. That kind of loops around, and there's a, there's a buckle. That's too bad. That's just one more detail that has to be painted. So I don't mind if this is actually a little streaky because I want the tunic to be streaky when I put the wash on. You know, because this is a peasant who's been working out in the mud, in the muck. And so its clothes are, are definitely not going to be like pristine. They're not going to be freshly laundered. There we go. So now it's brown. Yeah, I got a couple more colors of brown that I could use to paint more more brownish brown things. The next part are going to be the pants. And they're gonna go up against the tunic color, so that needs to dry a little bit before I paint. <laughs> it dries really fast. It'll be done like in a couple of minutes, but while I'm waiting for that, um, yeah, I can um, set this aside. Let's see, this leather brown hasn't been used in a while, so it probably needs a good deal of stirring. Nothing much to talk about while the paint is getting mixed. In a little while. This this color looks kind of pukey when it first goes on, but with a brown wash, it looks really pretty good. It really does look like leather. Um, yeah, and you know, 
I probably should wait a little bit longer, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go ahead and paint the pants. And I'm going to take a chance to and use this larger brush still. And hope that by painting up to, but not over the bottom of the tunic, I can just cover these really pretty quickly. If this might end up going way too fast, you know. Then what, what will I do then? Yeah, I just smashed the brush into the handle of the pitchfork, which fortunately has not been painted yet. Otherwise, that would have been a, a classic, a classic oops of, um, yeah, bumping the, bumping the paint-laden brush onto an already painted work surface on the way to or from the one I'm trying to paint. My most common oops. There's a lot of repetition in, on my monologue because um, it's not that I forget that I've already said it. I remember that I already said it. That's why I can say that's rep repetition. Okay. If I'd forgotten that I'd said it, then it wouldn't. I wouldn't recognize it as being a repetition, right? So I recognize that this is a repetition, you know, which should be encouraging to everybody listening that I, I still know what I've already said most of the time or not. And there we go. See, the, this guy's very brown. Um, and this is uh, a different color of brown, and then the boots will be a different color of brown. And then I'm going to make an effort to paint the belt the same color as the boots. So when it comes time to do that, I'll be getting out the head magnifiers and uh, doing my best to get the paint on that. And then I might have to come back with the, the cork brown to even out the lines because it's not very well defined. The belt is not well defined. But what we know is that the tunic and the pants are made out of different materials because they're we know that because i painted them different colors so one of the things i re repeated on this on this stream is the need for an oops button at least one oops button if not two um, because when i do something like I have paint on the brush and I bring it up and I go, oh, I didn't mean to put that right across the arm or at the top of the head. I meant to paint the handle of the torch. Um, if I had an oops button, I could go not only oops, but I could reach over, push the oops button and have a big oops thing come across the, the screen. Kind of like, you know, the break screen or something. It would be oops. And maybe it would have like a frowny face or a, I don't know, some sort of graphic that Nicole probably could draw because she's a good artist. You know, it would be kind of fun is to have that oops uh, there. And I would use it mainly for, you know, when I'm bringing a paint-laden brush up and bump it into something. Sometimes I knock things over and break things and stuff like that, but there's Usually at least once every stream, there's an opportunity to have an oops. Because it just is. Okay, this red brown is actually discolored compared to the color it should be. Because it kind of, anyway, it, it's near the bottom of the jar and um, some of the solvent evaporated and I used some thinner and it just sort of changed the color, right? So it's not really as nice a color as the red brown usually should be. It really is very pretty. But this is just perfect for a peasant boot and belt 
you know, kind of yucky dark brown. It's an opportunity to use this paint that I wouldn't be able to use otherwise. So this is going on the boots and the belt. And the boots are pretty easy to paint. I just have to get them up to the bottom of the pants, right? But the belt is going to be more of a chore because it's kind of ill-defined and it's a very narrow line. Um, you know, so it's not going to be not going to be a lot of fun doing that. I'm going to have to get a teeny brush out to do that. Use this brush on the boots. Again, these have fairly large surface area, but I, I just need to be careful around the top of the boots and the bottom pants to try to keep a fairly clean line. So this is supposed to be like a nice pretty chocolate brown, but it's got kind of, I don't know, it looks kind of greenish even. I'm not sure what happened. sure what happened to make it change color like this. It ch when it dries, it looks better than it does when it's wet. At least it has been so far. I'll see how it works. Anyway, it's a nice, it's brown. It's a different color brown. It's are made out of a you know, the pants and the tunic are two different materials, and the boots are yet another material. And uh, the belt will be made out of the same material as the boots. Using this brush on the boots, and then I'm going to get out a teeny brush and see what I can do with the belt. I want, you know, it, it's printed on there, so I might as well try to make it show. So whoever designed this thing went through the trouble of putting a belt on this peasant. But, you, you know, why not? Belts, peasants can have belts, right? I don't know that they could have metal buckles on their belts, though. I mean, this might be, this is a pretty upper-class peasant having a metal buckle on their belt, you would think that they'd be, you know, limited to just sort of tying it on, you know, kind of a knot or something, but uh, this this one has that. I don't know, maybe they had like a, an old farm implement or something that they reforged. You can make up a story about how did this peasant get a belt buckle. Maybe it's like a family heirloom. You know, the belt buckle might have been a, you know, maybe maybe there was a distant relative who served the the lord of the the area, you know, the landowner in a significant way or something, and um, said, well, and recognition of the amazing service that you did um, I will let you have this uh, used belt buckle you know and for a peasant family that could be quite a deal and it became like a family heirloom this one, this one inherited the belt buckle Maybe maybe someone wealthy enough to own a belt buckle just happened to like die on their land. That that used to happen, right? Riding along, they get thrown off their horse. They get sick. Whatever. So this guy didn't really inherit a family heirloom as much as uh, plundered a corpse. It's another way 
they could have gotten a belt buckle. Like a repurposed broken farm implement, an heirloom passed on from generations because some lord gave an ancestor a belt buckle. <sighs> yeah, gravity still works here. And the sticky tack let up. Yep. Repurposed farm implement. Oh, yeah. Plundering a body. And might have just plundered a body of somebody who happened to die near, you know, in the woods near them, or they stumbled onto it. Probably literally stumbled onto it, like they were just walking along at night for a reason. We don't know why. And they um, stumbled over a, a body and said, well, what have we got here? You know, and it had been there a while, so the clothes were kind of rotten, but the belt buckle was still okay. A little rusty, maybe, but um, still usable. I kind of like that story. The belt buckle came about by plundering a body. Yeah, so this red-brown isn't coming out. I mean, it's not the color of the red-brown that uh, it's supposed to be, but it kind of a crappy color, so uh, it works really well with a peasant here. Okay, well, I painted the belt, and the paint is where the belt is. Not so much where the belt isn't. And we'll call that a success. We need to have a little bit more here, though. Dangly bit, the dangly part of the belt there. To the dangly part. Okay. Oh, I missed an entire part of the pants. There's always that thing about when you look, when I look at something through the head magnifiers, there's always these amazing flaws. It's like right, right in the front of the pants, there was a piece, a patch that hadn't been painted. Okay, so there is our multi-brown, multi-brown colored uh, peasant, and all that's going to get washed in a brown wash. And... Yeah, there was there were several parts of this print that were messed up. Um, there were two places really. There were two flaws on the pitchfork. You can still see little remnants of them on, the, on there and there that I filed off. <clears throat> so it was like a tragically poorly forged pitchfork head, but um, he had a malformed ear. I don't know if you can really see it anymore, but this ear here, now it's out of focus. It won't focus. There we go, sort of in focus. This ear here had an appendage. This a big glob 
of misprint came down from the bottom of the ear to the top of the cowl. And so he had a disfigured right ear that um, I undisfigured sort of mostly, mostly pretty well by uh, filing that away. <clears throat> so that's part of his tragic backstory. Probably until now, I mean, that, that was malformed right until now because I just fixed it a little while ago. So he had right dangly, dangly right ear syndrome for uh, most of its life. Probably was ridiculed all the time. Hey, you peasant with the dangly right ear. Uh, no, it was, it was born with it. He was born with it. It wasn't a battle wound. This peasant hasn't been in a battle. There's no evidence of it of it every, having been in a battle. Um, even the belt buckle was not going to would not have been won in battle. The belt buckle. Well, it's not too well. It isn't that tragic, but you know, it's a peasant, and so their entire life was it was a tragic backstory. Their existence has been tragic living as a peasant. Probably isn't even their real pitchfork. It's probably like a, a communal pitchfork from the, the landowner's uh, uh, pitchfork holding shed. But no, it's not that tragic, other than their, their entire life being kind of tragic. It is bald. They're bald, so I'm guessing that, you know, they weren't sh head shaving. They might have shaved his head. I guess they did that. Nobles did that. They shaved their heads and then wore wigs, right? That way they didn't have head lice because they didn't have any hair for the head lice to live in. But that might be a tragic Part of the backstory is that uh, you know how come it's how come they're bald, whether it was intentional or not. See how this looks as a skin tone. Um, it looks pretty awful right now. It's really yellow, but you know it might be okay. If not, I'll I'll paint it a different color. It might just be kind of yellowish because of a bad diet or something. I'm not sure. I'm painting the skin now um, so I can get the hands done. And then I'll paint the, the shaft of the torch and pitchfork up, up to the hand. So this is supposed to look, they got a lump. Look, there's another tragic thing, is that there's a, a lump on the bottom of their wrist. That's an injury, but that's probably, that's like a farm work injury. So this color is supposed to look like you just been out working in the fields and and uh, you, your skin got dark from the sun. That's what it's supposed to look like. I don't know. Let's see. Once it dries, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just paint this arm and see how it looks. I've got another one that looks. It's not too bad. It looks kind of pink. It's uh, it's a color that ended up using on on her but she's kind of pale so i think you know being a sprite and all doesn't doesn't uh get sunburned or else i could just say i really don't care i mean this is this is just the color this is the color the peasant's going to be and uh why because that's the color i've got
mean, none of this is real anyway. These are all like pretend characters. Why is why are his arms and face this color? Because that's the color that was on the brush when I started painting it. That's as good a reason as any, I think, is isn't it? Yeah. Well, or maybe it's this color because of its tragic backstory. detailed fingers. Some of these models are just so amazingly detailed. And the detail holds up really well through the, through the printing. This is, you know, painting the face. What I need to do is get down to its yelling mouth that I painted red earlier. Down to the cowl here. Even the ears are, are really detailed. Pretty impressive, actually. To, when I get around to finishing the face, to paint its eyes in. That's kind of cool. Half his face is painted and the other isn't. Kind of looks weird. It'd be kind of a weird look. I could almost leave it like that. You can see how that worked. Where the the yelling mouth is, you know, it was kind of messy before, but I pretty successfully painted around it. You know, it just looks like he's got a mouth that's yelling, as opposed to a big blot of dark red paint all over its face. Yep, that's, that's some pretty major league shouting going on there. top of its head just a little bit more uniform. You don't need little weird spots there. Okay, well for you know for a simple peasant, it's not bad. I'm trying to keep it simple, simple peasanty looking. Okay. I'll get this cleaned off. Um then I'm going to paint the shaft on the pitchfork and the torch. You get the, this brush clean, getting these little brushes when the paint gets into the little base of the bristles sometimes. It's a little dangerous leaving this standing like this because uh, it can fall over. So I'll lay it down. And it serves two purposes. One is it can't fall because it's already down. I can knock it around, but I, it won't fall. And if it fell, the torch would break, the pitchfork would break. It would just be, it wouldn't be good. It would be a bad thing. 
Um, and the other is you can see it better. So this peasant's pretty brown. I'll be putting brown wash on it so it's going to look even like streakier, like streaky, and hopefully be okay. So this is a really dark brown, and it's going to use it for the shafts on the torch and the pitchfork to represent like wood, you know, dark wood. This is another one of those large bottles of paint that are very useful especially when painting large brown areas like piece, like wood, you know, wooden walls or trees or something like that. I used to use the bitty brush on this because I have to get it down to the hand. It's going all over the hand, right? And paint up to it's got a flame the flame will actually take a little while to paint I like I like to paint it at least two colors maybe three you know kind of yellow and orange and red you might just do it like light orange and red though I mean, this isn't a big fire, it's just a little torch fire. Almost, almost on camera. to make up a story about why you know peasants are always running around with pitchforks and torches right that's what peasants seem to do they do that there's a spot there I want to get I couldn't see couldn't see the tip of the brush because it was dark on dark yeah get it underneath here I'm having trouble with these lenses here today yeah. The, like the most carefully detailed spots on this entire thing are the handles of the implements you know kind of weird weird that that would be the case but it is you don't don't want the hands to be the color of the wooden shaft and vice versa the back of this is a little bit a little bit tricky getting it in there, especially since it's this part that no one's ever going to see. Yep, I'm going to have to fix that. The, um, in fact, I'm going to try to do that right now. There's a spot in the top of the hand that got like totally missed. wasn't that I got paint on it, it's that it never was painted. So I fixed that. I know it was kind of a digression, but sometimes I find that if I see something like that, 
it really is a good idea to fix it immediately. Otherwise, it uh, gets forgotten. And then I say, oh, this is done. And then I look at it and go, nope, definitely not done. Because there's a spot on the top of its hand that never got painted. This isn't the best brush to paint the shaft of this, but I don't want to get another brush out. As long as I don't break the brush, I guess it's okay. Hopefully this will not fall off. Metal starts there. Yeah, if this fell off the this that that would be bad if this fell off the sticky tack right now. Because it's likely that it would like land right on the edge and tumble down onto the floor and then large many pieces would be lost. And they're tiny little gray pieces and they'd they'd be lost forever and then I just basically have to throw this out and say, nope. Oh, it is a failure because of gravity. After I'm done painting this part of the the shaft of the pitchfork, I'm going to put some I guess that's okay. I was just looking at the top of the hand there. I'm going to put a, some yellow paint on the torch. Or light orange, probably. I'm going to use light orange and red on the torch. I'm going to put a, a base coat of yellow on it, and then I can touch the tips of it with, like, the reddish-orange, then, after it's dried. So if I get that yellow base coat on now, then there should be time to finish the torch. Okay, um, what did I want? I wanted this light orange color. There's a light orange. Is it too light? Do I want light orange or clear orange? Let me check my super duper sophisticated color chart here. <clears throat> This is a, this flame is not a very bright flame at all. It's not going to be like yellow. It's going to be orange and kind of red. Tiny little drops of paint out, and the, even tiny little drops of paint are way more than I need for these tiny little things that need to be painted. Yeah, see this, this is a peasant, the peasant can't afford like really good fuel for the fire for the torch. So the flame's going to be 
you know, not the not a real big bright yellow kind of flame. It's gonna be kind of orange and, and red. It's gonna be um flame is sort of wanting in high quality fuel. Just going to touch the tips of this with darker orange kind of color or maybe you know that's just really not i don't know we'll see how it looks when it tries it's supposed to be a lot brighter color but i think it's because it's on uh, gray primer do you think does that look flamey enough Red tips on it. I don't know. Um, I'm going to use dark aluminium on the pitchfork because I want to be able to rust it. I want it to be light enough to show um, you know what I'll use is this gun metal. Is that too dark? Shiny. You know, I'm gonna. Um, <coughs> if it's too dark, I can always paint over it. And then I'm gonna try my best to uh, get the belt buckle. This, the belt buckle is a prized family possession because peasants can't afford belt buckles. So it's like either, like I was saying, it's either a family heirloom from some ancestor who got it from a property landowner, you know, for having done a really good deed, like saving their cow or something. Um, or it's, uh, it's like stolen off of a corpse that they found. There's lots of ways they could have gotten a belt buckle, but none of it, none of those ways would have had anything to do with um, being able to actually purchase it. Just a little bit of a little bit of metallic flare. The of their entire village. The you peasant person. You got a shiny belt buckle. Well, where do you get that? Well, let me tell you the story of how grandfather, peasant person one, saved the landowner's cow from drowning in the stream. Doing that earned the pleasure of the landowner, cow owner, and got a belt buckle. We have passed this on to the eldest son who lived past the age of five, anyway, or seven or something. Um, 
or three generations now. This is going to be too dark. Yeah, it's not going to show the rust, okay? So it's not a bad color for a pitchfork, but even though I don't want a shiny pitchfork, I want it light enough to be able to show the brown color um, of the brown wash to make it look rusty because this, this peasant would not have had like a brand new pitchfork. So I'm going to let that dry just a little bit and um, find a lighter color. I don't know, maybe the chainmail silver, or maybe I'll just use one of the metallics, one of the light colored metallics. Um, so it isn't so much that I don't, that I want a shiny, bright metallic um, pitchfork. I want, I want a pitchfork that will show rust. Oh, dull, dull aluminum. Okay, this is good. It's not real shiny. It looks metallic. It'll have that kind of gray, silvery kind of look, but it won't be shiny because there's no way that this pitchfork would be. I mean, it's going to be rusty and dull. So this dark color would have been would be pretty good, but it's just too dark for uh, for the rust to show. You know, we'll try this color, and if if it works fine, if not, just keep a painting until I get it right. Because you know, there's nothing the most important part of a disgruntled, um, disaffected peasant is its pitchfork. It doesn't have the shiny metallic look to it that it did before. Yeah, I, you know, it's either going to, it, it should work. Hopefully it'll work okay. <clears throat> Are we doing on time? I have a half hour yet. Oh my. Um, well, I need to let that dry a little bit and then I'm going to get out the brown wash and a little bit bigger brush and make the clothes all streaky, okay? And I use a brush kind of like this with kind of a broad, soft tip on it. And um, I want to use fairly, a fairly large amount of wash on it because I want it, the color, I want the color to change too so that it looks darker. And all I'm going to be doing is like streaking down all the way down from top to bottom, just like that. Okay, I'm practicing. Just like that, I want it to look streaky and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, I can do this now. Why don't I do that? Um, I just want some orange, kind of dark orangey highlights on the brush, on the on the flame. Brush it on. That's not quite what I was trying to do, but it's a it's a peasant's field torch flame. It looks a little more flamey now than it did before. I think I think it looks okay. It looks more flamey. Yeah, the, the darker, almost reddish color helped make it look like it's supposed to be flamey. So before I mess with the wash, and it's always a risky thing, you know, just to do that, 
still launch it because yeah yeah if worse comes to worse if it ends up looking really horrible then spray it with primer again and go for it go back for it it should be straightforward just kind of You make that some bloop 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 and then put some on the pitchfork. Um, and what I'll be using is this dark brown, this dark brown wash. And you can see uh, the pigment has, you know, you can't, now you can see it. The pigment has settled, okay, pretty badly in this. So it needs, it needs a lot of uh, shaking up and stirring. So I'm gonna take these off for now. And I should have brought down a glass of water, but uh, yeah. Work, work, work. This is almost like having a job, you know? Not like having a job. It's relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. So Dungeon, Dyson Dungeons is um, dedicated to staying on camera, kind of. There we go. I'll lay this down again so you can can see what's going on. <clears throat> While I'm shaking this and battling it, mixing it, and doing my best to get the pigment distributed evenly throughout the, the solvent. <laughs> Dyson Dungeons is a group of family and friends who uh, put on a Dungeons & Dragons show that streams on Twitch with a live chat three Sundays a month at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And we'll change that to Eastern Daylight Time when Daylight Saving starts. But for now, it's Eastern Standard Time. And if you can't catch it with the live chat, you can watch past episodes on YouTube or listen to them as a podcast. And I am a participant in that show. I play a furbog fighter. I'm the tank. I get beat up a lot. You know. Um, it isn't my in, wasn't my intent when I created the character, but that's how it's turned out. Anyway, it's a lot of fun to watch, and if you watch that stream, you'll frequently see um, mini figs and dungeon tiles that were prepared before your very eyes on relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. But the D and D show is is really good. Our characters are a lot of fun. We spend a lot of time searching for the perfect pretzel wherever we go. Um, it's like a good PG-13 rated sort of thing. So it's fun for everybody. We have, uh, you know, a lot of role playing. It's a whole lot of role playing. And then sometimes we have combat because in D&D you have to have combat. You know, and that gets kind of intense because I, as a player, am not very good at remembering what the rules are about esoteric things like, and how much does a healing potion heal anyway. I provide the opportunity for a narrative during the show by basically letting everybody know I can't remember things. Please explain the rule again. We learn rules like about healing potions and different attacks and what's a bonus action and what isn't and what can you do and what can't you do and how does this magic item work again. So my character, as because of my limitations of memory as a player, provide that opportunity as well. So if you're new to Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and we run into something that's esoteric or just common, um, get to learn about the rules as well. We, do, we explain those, DM explains them anyway as we go along, so that's kind of cool. But again, it's a, you know, and if you're a more advanced player, then you can, you know, talk about, you can see how the rules get modified just to keep the, the show interesting and so on. And there's even an opportunity in chat to complain about all those sorts of things and have a debate. And just like with this, you can uh, become a follower and that's really appreciated. If you watch on YouTube, you can become a sponsor. 
And you can always go to, always, you can do this. You can go to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons and become a patron. And if you become a patron, you get access to the DM's notes that are used in preparation for the sessions and also to our warm-up improv sessions, which I have to say are really kind of hilarious. We have a lot of fun warming up. See, this is just kind of, I just want this to look streaky and I'm succeeding in that. Picking up some of the creases and bends and things in the clothes. And it changes the color kind of nicely instead of that dull, that dull look. It's now got uh, a nice sort of deeper brown. And I squeezed out like 10 times more of this than I needed. Sometimes happens when one is painting. But you can see it goes on pretty easily and it has the effect that I want of making it look, you know, a little weather worn. Discolored. Maybe get it on less, a little unevenly even, intentionally uneven. If I were a really good artist, you know, like Nicole, I would say, oh, you can even say, you know, this is the part where it would be darker and this is where it would be lighter and show realistic aging and weathering and stuff. But I'm not that kind of skilled artist. And anyway, this isn't that kind of figure. This isn't the display figure where I'm trying to make it look like an authentic peasant. And what I am tempted to do is put a little bit of it, just a little bit of it. I want to see what happens if I put it on the fingers here. Again. I should probably try to do something with the eyes. Okay, well that looks that looks better. I mean, it looks worse, so that makes it better. In that it's kind of splotchy now. Um, yeah, the different colors of brown still show through. It's not. I mean, it didn't disguise them too much. It's not too bad. The shouting is. Do oh yeah, I have to make it look rusty. Especially around the base of it, the bottom of the, of this pitchfork would definitely be kind of rusty. Maybe maybe do so much tines. Okay, well this is like a study in brownness, that's for sure. It's a lot of brownness here, and um, all we should do now is try to use the really fine point felt tip pen to put eyeballs on it so you can see the eyes and then I'll paint the base <laughs> I should be able to get that done yet but let me let me try my best to get some eyes on here and then um, on Wednesday, Submarine Wednesday, we'll be seeing almost the completion, at least the parts of the submarine that can be completed. That can be completed on the stream, which is to say the parts that don't involve spraying paint. So as I said, there's no there is no studio here, so there isn't any way to show paint spraying. Since there's no way to do that, I won't try. 
Okay, well, the eyes are darker now, so you can kind of see where they are. Um... Got this green wash that I'm going to be putting on the color that I put on the bottom. I usually use goblin green. Goblin green is a quick, kind of a good yellowish green base that makes it look. Goblin green works. The old flat green, depending on what I find here. I found the goblin green, so that's what I'm going to use. <laughs> um. Yeah, I can get the base done, and then I will have completed the Quetzalcoatl and uh, a peasant, a rampaging, you know, I don't know, angry. Maybe he's angry. Maybe he's just trying to find a, like a missing calf or sheep or something. I don't know. I don't know what the story is. to make up a good story. The story is that uh, it's a peasant carrying a torch and a pitchfork because that's, you know, that's how it should be done. This goblin green separates really shortly much. You get a huge separation between them. Another green that does this, yeah, the, oh, it, the turquoise blue that separates significantly. You can even see it, the color separation there in the bottle. It mixed up pretty pretty well. You can still see a little streakiness in it, but it's not too bad. Some of the other colors probably do that too, but it's not so obvious. Making this green uh, because everything else is brown. <laughs> pretty much. And then I'm going to use some green wash and just dapple the green wash, blob it on to make it look, you know, like maybe it's, maybe it's feel, a field of grass or something. But just so it doesn't look like just flat green monochrome kind of base. You know, if I were doing a display model, I'd probably get, uh, you know, this fine green little particles, right? These little particles and make it look like grass. The kind of stuff you use for railroad modeling and all. But that's not what this is about. This is... I don't... This one's almost certainly never going to show up on the on the D&D &D, uh, campaign because unless it represents a giant. I mean, it might be a giant farmer. Maybe it is. Maybe this is a giant peasant because it's in terms of scale. My character is a fur bog and it's almost eight feet tall, comes up to about here, about chest high. So this is even bigger than a fur bog. This, this would have to be a giant. And I'm not sure in our campaign, you know, whether we're showing up any land of giants anywhere. I don't think so. I kind of hope not anyway. So this one probably is just going to be, you know, a relaxing painting exclusive and not show up in our D&D uh, &D campaign, the Quetzalcoatl, right? That would be kind of cool if it did. Okay. I don't need to let this, you know, dry all the way before I put the wash on because I want the wash to look kind of blobby anyway. So if it you know, dissolves into the paint a little bit, I think that would be fine. But I'm going to uh, clean the brush a little bit, but I'll let it dry a little bit. While I'm doing that, I'm going to show off the thing that I finished today. 
I did most of this on Friday. I got everything except the head done on Friday, and then I finished the head today. And I think, you know, especially on camera, it actually looks pretty decent. The white dry brushing on that on the head made it look more like the uh, the picture that I got of what it should look like. And then I just painted kind of a beige base, just, you know, so that it's something to stand on, but there'd be a contrast. So I think this guy came out, this came out pretty well. And maybe we'll be lucky enough to have it appear, do a cameo appearance on Dungeons and Dragons with Dyson Dungeons. That would be kind of cool if it did. I'd like that. This is a wash. There's near the end of its life. So there's less solvent than there usually is in this sort of thing. Anyway, um, this is kind of a yellowish green. And I just I'm just gonna dapple it on here. No, I shouldn't have no, it just mixed it. I just wasted it. I mixed it in with Put it in the well with the other paint and that i don't know why i did that it was a mistake it all just got mixed together let's see is it creates light and dark areas so it kind of looks you know like you know maybe mossy short grass that kind of thing Right, I'm going to let this dry and set it. Let's let it stand because that stuff will flow and who knows how it'll flow. Probably not in a way that's helpful. I'm going to let this stand here and you can look down at its bald head and its uh, multi brownness. It's much, it's much, much brownness. A lot of brownness there. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Wednesday. On Wednesday, I've got the, the, the outside of the hull, the inside of the, of the submarine is done. I finished that um, last week. I got the last bits installed. And so the inside of the submarine, which is like 95% of it, is completed. And I'll be showing that off on Wednesday as well. And now I've got some of the outside to do. The nose, the, the bow needs to be cemented on. That'll be easy. If it fits, I'll just cement that on. And then the tail, the aft of it, where the propeller and the dive planes and things are, is a really complicated kind of thing, where there's the opportunity to cement things together the wrong way or to fail to get enough cement on them and so they don't hold together at all. So I got those parts prepped. I did that on last Wednesday got them all ready to be cemented together so I will cement those I'll probably do that near the beginning of the stream because if it holds together and it's and it doesn't need to be pried apart and redone I'll be able to cement that onto the back end or the aft of the submarine so that the external bow and stern of the submarine will be completed um, because they're parts that are being cemented together they have seams you know, there's no way you can cement these things without having a seam show. So I've got some filler putty that goes into the seam. And then after that dries, which will be in the future, I'll sand it all down so it's smooth. And then I'll be painting the outside of the hull a dark gray. But I'll be spray painting that so you won't be able to see it. But hopefully on Wednesday, what you will see by the end of the stream is the, no, the bow and the stern of the submarine completed and maybe even having the uh, the propeller done the part that's a little tricky is that there's the there are like three levels of two levels of hatches for the missile tubes because this is a missile firing submarine and the very top one is attached to the outside of the hull and is cemented in and I test fit it 
and um, part of it doesn't fit because the hull itself is a little bit warped. It's bent in, which means that there's this like 16th of an inch gap that shows that is not good. And so there's a couple of ways I can try to fix that that I've been thinking about. One is to try to unwarp it. Um, and that's going to be very difficult to do, and I don't think I'll be able to pull it off. The other is to, and this is what I'm actually going to try, is to fabricate a small piece of plastic to insert in next to the bulkhead. The part that's warped is right next to a bulkhead and kind of dips down under the bulkhead. And I want it to be the same level as the top of the bulkhead, is to fabricate a piece of plastic that will attach. To, so there's a double bulkhead. One is, you know, next to where the top of the, the deck is of the submarine, and the other one will go underneath it and push it up so that it's even. Uh, the plastic is malleable, so I think I might be able to pull that off. Ooh, finger gestures. Um, we'll see. We'll see if it's possible to do that. The other thing that will happen Wednesday, and this is, you know, besides seeing how all of that goes, is I'm going to pick the successor to the submarine because I've got just this one stream and maybe one more on the submarine, unless things go poorly, in which case I'll have many more. Um, I need to do something next. And I do have a submarine model, but it's not a very good one, at least for the stream. So I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, so Submarine Wednesday will now become something else Wednesday. I might still call it Submarine Wednesday, but I'll be doing something other than the submarine starting probably sometime in March. And it came down to two models. Now I'm going to move this out of the way, otherwise I will definitely drop it and break it. I'll show it back to you at the end. I've got two models that are in the running. One is Porco Rosso's Savoia S21 complete complete with a porco rosso okay and this is a pretty cool model if if i built it correctly it would end up looking like that and just like the submarine actually the top of the fuselage comes off and you can see the internal components which is cool and then in addition to the porco rosso inside the cockpit there's a standalone porco rosso that could be painted to look really cool like that if I was really good at it, I might be able to pull that off. So this is definitely in the running. It's, um, the parts are fairly small. It's 148th scale, but it's not a very big plane. Uh, but this is what it looks like. These are all the parts. The instructions are entirely in Japanese. Yep, everything is in Japanese. The only helpful thing about it is that they have really good pictures. Okay, like that. They are really good pictures and numbers. And so it should be, you know, it should be pretty easy to figure out where the uh, where the pieces all go. There's no help in terms of painting instructions. So I'll just have to look at, you know, the box top if I built this one. The other one that's in the running is a much bigger model. So you'll be able to see it and I'm going to show it like a scan. This is the Apollo lunar spacecraft, the entire thing. The uh, compartment where the LEM was located, okay? Now this isn't exactly how it worked in real life, but this is how the model works. There's hinged panels so that you can see the LEM in, in, sight, in situ inside the fairing, but you can also take it out. It's a separate model, which is cool. And then there's a service module. And I'll show you the side of the box. The service module ha also has a hatch that opens up so you can see the entire side. The command module, the little the hatch actually opens up and there's um, a astronaut models that sit inside of that. So you can see that and then that. So this and that shows you how the Lem, these components come apart then too. You can stack them like shown on the cover, or you can display them separately like this. You know, and that's how the lem sits inside. And that's the lem. That's the 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 mo that's the module underneath the lem, and that's the lem that has 
that is a model all by itself, and that's kind of fun. It's got the gold foil on it and everything, which is cool. And on this side, you can see the uh, the detail on the top and the bottom and the inside. See how the service module opens up, and you can see all the propellant tanks and stuff. And then on the command module, the um, the hatch opens, and you can see the astronauts inside supposedly you should be able to do there yeah so um yeah anyway um one of these two i went through like maybe seven or eight alternatives some of them were kind of cool some were just silly and i just wanted to show you what i had um one of those two is going to be the successor to the submarine and the successor will be announced I will be announcing the successor on Wednesday. Um, but as I'm wrapping up, because it's just about two o'clock, what I did today was I finished the uh, Quetzalcoatl, got the head done, and it came out looking okay. As a model, I think that's pretty cool, and I really would like to see this one show up in our D&D &D campaign, maybe just as a cameo or something, you know? where it just goes up and says, Hi, I'm a big bird thing, serpent bird thing, and worship me or I will not like you or, it'll, or something, whatever, whatever the DM decides. I'm, I think it should be friendly though. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be nasty. And then I finished the peasant because this was just easy to do. And it was just a lot of brown, much brown. Um, you know, a little flame on the torch and a little rusty pitchfork going on there. Uh, but yeah, I was able to get that all done in uh, in one stream because it was straightforward. And the brown wash turned out okay, you know. It looked kind of streaky, it darkened it down. The colors all kind of blend together because you don't want, you know, too many colors on it. The, the face is, you know, obviously yelling at something for a reason. I don't know why. I think I can take this off now. Let's see if I can pop this off. Yep, without breaking anything. That was good. And so Submarine Wednesday, we get to see more Submarine finishing, close to being finished. And then Friday, I'm going to probably work on this little minor guy. I think I'm going to call it a halfling. The ears pointed. I can't really tell. I'll have to look. Um, I'm going to check it over for, you know, flaws. But there's a minor, you know, little minor guy. Not not minor as in, like, under the age of adulthood, but minor as in mining things underground or in the ground, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to make it a rich one. The backpack's going to be full of gold and silver nuggets and a giant nugget being in its hand. So that'll be that'll be fun. And if I finish that, I've got either this big hammer demonish kind of guy. I need to ask what it really is. It might be kind of fun to paint. You know, it's got really, uh, uh, you know, just bizarre looking armor on its shoulders and legs and hardly anything in between. So that might be kind of fun to do. And I also have a goose. For some reason, I thought it would be fun to have a giant goose playing a lute. And I joked, and I hope it's just a joke, that this would be the next incarnation of our tabaxi bard, who is now actually a badger. And there's some there's some bits on here that need to be cleaned up. I can see it right here. There's a printing flaw there that's actually sticking up over the top of the lute. So, yeah, and then there's some strings on the wings. There always are, like here and here. There's always those kind of things that need to be cleaned up. So I don't know, I might spend some time. There's a blot, a little dot there. I might spend some time um, on Friday, actually cleaning this up a little bit, just to have it cleaned up. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start this until yeah. There's just a lot of stuff on this one, 
So I'll probably spend like the beginning of Friday cleaning this one up, you know, with a file and a, and a knife, just trying not to break anything while I clean up the little strings. And then I'm gonna paint the little half bling miner. And depending on how that goes, I'll start working on the big hammer guy. So just to let you know that I'll be taking next week off, just real quickly letting you know, I'll remind everybody on Wednesday, uh, more travel. Yep, there's always there's been a lot of interference with relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons this, this year already, but there'll be more. So I'll, um, I'll be here Wednesday and Friday this week, and then the way it looks now, probably not next week. I'll confirm that and let everybody know on Wednesday. So there's nothing showing. I've got nothing on screen. Yeah, let me put these guys back. Yeah, to let you know that I've done something. Here I am. Having done... Yeah, that, that's better. There, There's something that has been done on Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons. Thanks for being a follower. Thanks for being a sponsor. Thanks for going to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons. Patreon.com slash dice and dungeons. Becoming a patron and getting all sorts of perks and stuff like that from dice and dungeons. And I will see you Wednesday, um, more or less at 10. Uh, the, I don't have any reason to start late on Wednesday, at least that I know of yet. <laughs> so thanks. Take care. See you Wednesday at more or less 10 o'clock.